The following program contains archived content. Some of the information may now be out of date. Welcome everybody to my podcast, Big Little Small Talk. I'm Megan O'Hara Sullivan and I love to talk, but I also love to listen. If you're new here, welcome. Thanks for joining me today. I hope you enjoy the episode. Today is September the 11th and we are here interviewing Robin Prentice who I met last weekend when I came to a 60th squash anniversary here at the courts in James Street and I got talking to Robin and I found her story so interesting that I had to come back and do a proper interview for my big little small talk segments here on 40DB. Now Robin, I'm going to start by asking you on this auspicious anniversary of September 11 where you were 20 years ago. September 11, 20 years ago, that was uh, 20 years ago, oh, 19... The 9-11, when the, 9/11, when the planes... 9-11, I know, I remember yeah. it well, a uh, horrific occasion in the world, and I'm just trying to remember where I was. The year would have been 20... 2001. 2001. 2001, I was in Australia. Right. Actually. And do you have a clear memory of what happened on 9-11 or oh, hearing about it? Oh, do you yeah. remember? Yes, I remember seeing the TV news coming on and just standing there thinking this could not be happening. Mm. This could not be happening mm. in our world and there it was. Did you feel a certain, because you have travelled a lot in the world, and did you feel a certain amount of fright or terror that something might be coming towards Australia? I felt more for the incident at the time because I worked 10 years in Canada as a coach and I knew that I had friends in New York Mm. and I was terrified that they might have been involved in this and you have no way of knowing with the catastrophe that was there. So that was my first feeling. Oh my God, I wonder if Santos all right. I wonder if so. One of them, one of them was one of my juniors that I coached over there and she took a big financial position in New York. And uh, I knew she will, and I found out later she she actually w- was three blocks away. Wow, very close. At the yeah, time. chilling. So isn't it? yeah, it was chilling, and I must admit, um, yeah, my mind after that, my mind went to, oh, what's this going to mean to the rest of the world? Mm. Yeah, certainly, mm. that went through my head, thinking, mm. hey, where is this going? Yes, but, I, I mentioned it before about meeting you last weekend. So last mm. weekend was a big occasion here for squash in yeah. Toowoomba. So can you tell me what happened last weekend? Yeah, last weekend was a, a reunion. Mm. I guess I could say I had the idea that I wanted to bring together people that had played way back when I started in Toowoomba. I started playing in Toowoomba about 1960, and uh, that was when squash was just getting off the ground, forming associations and. I, because my life had taken me in like three chapters, the chapters here for 25 years in Toowoomba squash and then away for 10 years in another squash world over there. And I've been back here in Australia 22 years. So I wanted to bring together those people that I hadn't caught up with. So it's the Robin and, Prentice show last weekend, in, well, and you're telling me. I didn't want it to be the Robin no. Prentice show, <laughs> Megan, you know. <laughs> I, I didn't want it to be like that because... I was very much one of the people in Toowoomba that was in the paper a lot, all my squash achievements I was getting. Uh, I used to write for the paper, but a lot of people used to write about me too, my achievements. So it, it was, I didn't want it to be about me. I know, because but all, all things in, like that have to be organised by someone. Someone and has say, to do that's it. that's right, yeah. there's always the doer. So and it say, was you the were Robin Prentice <laughs> show, but I wanted it to be about everyone that came out that day. And... Um, it certainly ended up that way. Was it? And, and you, you had know, a great time. You had well, saw faces that you hadn't seen for a long I time. I did. I did. I caught up with some people. But what was more heartening in the aftermath was the fact that I helped other people catch up with each other that hadn't seen each other in years. That was the, the heartening part about it. Like, I caught up with one lady who, I, who knew me as a 17-year-old when I first started. She was playing a comp here. And she heard one of my radio broadcasts and she called me out of the blue. And I had not talked or seen that friend in 50 years wow <laughs> so we i was blown away when she phoned me up I, she got my number oh, off the radio yeah. station so tell me amazing about, night, tell, me amazing about night. Um, tell me about squash in the 60s in toowoomba how did it sort of get off the ground were there many courts then and had it been something that was always played here i remember 
on the Sunshine Coast. I had a friend whose parents owned a squash court and that was in 1976, 77. But I don't remember sort of squash before that. Is it an old sport or? Oh, it was very big, very big. Uh, when I started in the 60s, there was a five court centre in Toowoomba and there had been a court at Lennon's. There was a couple of courts at Lennon's. Five Which court is now Burke and Wills, Burke is that Wills. right? It's now Burke that and Wills. Five court that used, no, that used to be a couple of courts there. Oh, wow. That's where it started. When I started, there were two courts running there. They ended up closing up, and then the Bell Street Centre was five courts. I ended up managing that, and I went in as a partnership there. Then the slosh just exploded in the city. Ten court centres. There was a ten court centre built at uh, Willows, Kitchen Street, and another one in Moffat Street and then one out near the airport. So when I left for Canada in 1989, there were five centres still flourishing in 1989. Oh, right. And a lot of courts being occupied very frequently. Right. Yeah. And how did you start playing squash? What brought what, you to squash? What brought squash? me to squash? <laughs> That's a good question. I was a, I was a tennis player. I was an A-grade tennis player. I came in from country life. I grew up in the country. I grew up in the bush, west of Dolby. And I uh, came into Toowoomba when I was about 11. And I played tennis, but I had to ride to tennis everywhere. My parents didn't, my mum didn't drive, they didn't have a second car, so I rode my bike <laughs> pretty mm-hmm. much all around mm-hmm. Toowoomba playing tennis. Loved it. But then I'd look forward to tennis all week and it'd rain. <laughs> so mm. I, got, I got enticed into squash after my social club started to uh, offer, there was a centre at a service station that a man called Russ Brown used to run. Everyone knew Russ Brown those days. He'd run a service station and there were squash courts there. Whereabouts was that? Opposite the old police station. Okay. Opposite the old police station at the back of the post office there, the Mm -hmm. old post office. Anyway, Russ used to give away 15 minutes of fuel. If you bought your fuel there, he'd give you 15 minutes of squash. My social club used to save up all the squash (laughs) and we'd have a great night out. We'd go play squash and then go to the Flying Dutchman, which was running then. It was the hot coffee shop after the theatre. Right. I like so, Russ's um, co, co-businesses, co you know, the, yeah. I like his idea. That's an entrepreneur, oh, that was, isn't it? If oh, you buy great. some fuel, I'll give you 15 yeah. minutes on the squad. It was great. Yeah, so that night I went out to play in the social club and strangely enough, because I was a pretty active tennis player, uh, I was used to running up the fence on the sidelines. <laughs> that night, I actually ran into the wall of the squash court and knocked myself out. Oh, my God. So that was the That, <laughs> that was, was the my introduction to squash. Right. You knocked yourself out? Well, I locked myself out. I was out for minutes. Literally, knocked minutes. yourself out. Out cold for minutes. Right. Head. So on the back of that, a lady that was playing there that night, they were playing fixtures there, and she saw me playing. And I still remember her saying to me this as though it was yesterday, Oh, Robin, she said, come out and play fixtures. You might be all right at this game. You know, come out and play fixtures. So from that next week, I started playing fixtures and I walked into a, oh, we need a results secretary too. Could you do results? I said, yeah, I'm a secretarial world. I can do that. So I became, a job. I became results secretary in the next uh, 23 years. <laughs> so I was involved. It, that was squash. Turns out you were mm. kind of more than all right at squash, wasn't it? Like you started playing, knocked yourself out in the first game and then what happened from there from there I just got hooked on squash I uh, because tennis was fading I was finding I went back to tennis and I couldn't get engaged in tennis it wasn't uh, the excitement of squash and squash does that to you the sensation of hitting the ball and the, the mind game so I got hooked and I decided well I'll set some goals here so I set my goal on uh, beating the tournament champion. How long will that take me? Oh, it took me about three years. Right. <laughs> and, so it didn't and come then, quickly. Uh, yeah. Yeah, no, yeah, I had to work away, at it. Yeah. And, uh, and no coaching in those days. Mm-hmm. Like I was self-taught pretty much. Mm-hmm. So I went into a centre. I ran the centre at Bell Street for some time. I started a junior program. And then I started to develop my game until um, 1980. I wanted to coach in that centre and earn from it and build the centre up. So that was when the game was amateur and professional now it's all it's all even you don't Uh have to declare professionalism but at those times I had to declare I was a professional so that was in 1980 I'd been in the Queensland team since 1971 when we got to 1980 I had to declare myself professional so that put me out of that team that year Mm -hmm. because it was all amateur at that stage so Mm -hmm. yeah I was hooked pretty much but so you just skipped lightly over the part that you were the Queensland champion there 
Yeah, right. Bit, so yeah, t- tell me about well, like how you I, sort of started beca- winning competitions and I what s- happened there. Well, I started playing the squash circuit, which was a tournament every two to three weeks. Mm-hmm. So I set my goal first on being Toowoomba champion. And I was Toowoomba champ, except for two breaks out having my beautiful sons. I was Toowoomba champ for about 20 years. From, 20 years? Yeah, from <laughs> 19, from uh, I think my first one was around 1970. Actually, I've got here in my was, little bit of research, 1970 to 1988. Does that sound... That's right? about right. <laughs> 1988, because then I went to Canada. 18 oh, years. Right. Yeah. So, but in that time, I didn't win every Toowoomba championship because sometimes I didn't play. Mm-hmm. But I was noted as being the Toowoomba champ. Mm-hmm. And, and, uh, so basically that's in all that ages, me. is it, Robin? That's no, that was no. open. That that's was open. open, yes. Yeah, that okay. was open. Yeah. Yeah. So then I, in 1971, I made the Queensland team for the first time. So that's Queensland Open. Okay. So in that team, uh, a lady called Marion Jackman was my team captain for Queensland. And my first year away, I went to Hobart. Mm-hmm to play the Australian Open Championships. Now at that time, if you think back to very different to squash in our world now, that it was Australia was on top of the world. Australian players, men's and women's, led world squash. Is that right? In the no, top rankings. Yeah, yeah. yeah. They led world squash. So the likes of Marion Jackman, who was my team captain that year, she was number two or three in the world under Heather Mackay. Right. Heather Mackay well-renowned uh she's the biggest icon in women's squash she was unbeaten in the world for 16 years right and yeah. heather mckay heather McKay. where does she come from she's from act queen Bien. okay right. so yeah. she was my idol mm-hmm. she became my idol as a young person i'm aspiring to be uh, like her mm-hmm. and after many years in the queensland team uh, in 1988, I took a, a job in Canada coaching. I went over, and there's another big chapter of my coaching life over there mm. where I built uh, the program at the private club over there with a lot of Canadian uh, junior champions. Mm-hmm. I want but, to talk about yeah, Canada a yeah. little bit later on. But yeah, we want to stay with, stay with you. Sure. With you. Okay. Well, I, I'm kind of interested to mm-hmm. know... I love hearing about people's upbringing, and you said you were west of Dolby, so where were you? Well, my dad was a chef farmer bit of jack of all trades and I actually started school in Warwick Mm -hmm. and I was at I think I counted up five schools I started school in Warwick then I was at school in Boona where dad got different jobs then we ended up from Boona out in Dolby a little place called Ducklow little siding and dad had a share farm there right and I went to school out there and that's where I started to play a bit of tennis Mm -hmm. and from there when I was about 11 my dad got a job on the public works department here in uh, Toowoomba and he got it, we got into town, city living in Toowoomba. Mm-hmm. So we moved to Toowoomba. I ended up at uh, East School and uh, played every sport that was going, except hockey. My mum would not allow me to play hockey. Why? Why <laughs> it's too dangerous? <laughs> I might get well, I don't lose know. an she eyes had this, or something. She had this thing about hockey. Right. But, uh, and did, were your mother and father sporty people themselves? No, not really. They no. all worked. They never did pretty much anything but work. Too much, yeah, Very not enough much time work. for leisure, just not enough, enough time, time for, for working. Yeah, my yeah. dad worked at everything all his life. Right. And my mum supported it. I was youngest of six. Well, that was my next yeah, question. Youngest of, of six. Yeah, yeah. And um, basically, uh, I was the sporty one in my family. My sister... Beverly, she was the next sister to me. She was in Toowoomba Base too. She played a bit of squash here mm-hmm. as well. Mm. And yeah, she played golf and squash, but mm-hmm. not too many of the others did. Mm. Earlier in their lives they did. Mm-hmm. But uh, yeah, I loved my country life. I loved my mm. country upbringing. But the move to Toowoomba opened up uh, lots of different opportunities, tennis for sure. Yeah. And um, were your parents supportive of your oh, yeah. squash or were you sort of already working by the time you started to have a lot of success and you didn't really yeah. kind of need their uh, encouragement or financial backing, I guess? Yeah. No, there wasn't uh, a lot of that, but it's certainly encouragement. They were very proud of what I did, mm. but they never saw me play hardly. Right. You Is know, that because they were working still? Yeah, yeah right. working. And mum didn't drive. Yeah. Uh, So I started to come through. I only started playing when I was 17. So I was working when I was just 15. Mm. I started work. Mm. And um, from Toowoomba State High here. And uh, from there, I got into coaching. 
got all my coaching degrees mm. to the point I'm, you know, uh, highly qualified as a coach now. Mm -hmm. But my parents were very supportive. But my mum found it, she came to watch one match, I think, mm -hmm. but then she was worried about her heart. She got too excited. <laughs> <laughs> and I was worried. She'd get very excited. Just as and well she wasn't there that first day you got on the court. Exactly. No, 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 no. exactly. Your mum would have been there to see the, the rest of the exactly. success, the meteoric exactly. rise yeah. to fame. Yeah. Now, you were telling me last weekend about, mm -hmm. and you just mentioned before, how in the middle of your squash career, you managed to have two children. Is that correct? Mm. I, I did actually at the start I was um, my s first son was born uh, he was 15 months old when I first played for Queensland he was 15 months so I um, yeah that was uh, challenging and was there other mothers on the circuit on the squash circuit or in, in um, competition or were the only one yeah there were other mothers around that I used to compete against mm -hmm. but once I got to be um, once I lifted my game in Toowoomba I found I was having to go to Brisbane. It became very evident that if I wanted to make the state side, I had to get to Brisbane to play the top women because I'd trained to work with the men. All right. But the men's game of squash is different to, at a top level. is different mm. to what, top How women. is that? Why, why is it different? Uh, because uh, the, the men's game is a lot more, a lot more rallying, a lot more power, a mm. lot more driving. Whereas uh, women's squash in those years too was how I developed my game was a lot more shot playing. So you go for more shots, you mm -hmm. attack the ball more, mm -hmm. and therefore I'd be used to playing the men in Toowoomba, mm. and I'd be standing back. I'd go to Brisbane to play a tournament that weekend, and you know you get too used to standing back in the mm. court, and mm -hmm. the women would play short. Right. So it was a different game I had yeah. to. So I, I for six years I went up and down. So how often Brisbane. would you go to Brisbane? Uh, I played fixtures down there for many of those years. Mm. Yeah. And would that be once a week or once twice a week? Once a week, once right. a week, right. and then the tournaments would be every second weekend. Okay. Yeah. And how did you manage with the kids then? Tell me about that. Very organised. Right. You might yeah. say I had to be very organised. Yeah. They were at school uh, once I started to go to Brisbane, and uh, I would have to be... I was working the centre at the time, so I'd have to be very organised with meals, a lot of pre pre-cooked meals in the freezer I'd come home get them to school I'd go train in the morning before they got up then I'd come home breakfast school they'd be off to school I'd go to the courts I'd actually uh, do my training at the courts I started before I went in to manage the courts I'd go down and practice without lights so I didn't have to pay too much in the daytime so I could train just right. do, just do solo hitting. Training then, like I would imagine now, training is all sort of doing weights as well as cardio and all these different things. Was was training in those days? Was it just squash and more squash? No, I used to run a lot in the early years. Uh -huh. I used to do a lot of fun runs and mm -hmm. a lot of running training. Um, I got off the road, so to speak, from running. I was hearing of the hips breaking down in a lot of the top international players. Mm. So I went into the gym. I did aerobics over there. Okay. So I did a lot of aerobics, a lot of gym work. There was a club that opened up called Club in Shape in the Hooper Centre years ago mm -hmm. at that time. And I've got a few bit of memorabilia on that. I became a bit of their role model and they'd uh, put me out in a photograph doing my workout in their gym <laughs> and all of that stuff. So I got a little bit of a gym right. membership. Right, that's right. Oh, that's right. It <laughs> was a bit of a trade-off. Quid pro quote, 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 yeah. quote So you were sort of at this stage, you, um, your celebrity or your sort of your name in Toowoomba mm. was getting bigger and bigger. And then what sort of prompted the move to Canada? At that point, I'd been um, 23 years, I think, in Toowoomba. And I married for down mm -hmm. and I was on my own with a 15-year-old boy to educate, mm -hmm. take through uni. Mm -hmm. And I got an opportunity through a player that used to run this centre, mm -hmm. this uh, centre in James Street. And he was a good player, Ian Payton. And he actually, I ran into him in New Zealand when I was playing, when I won the World 40 Plus Masters. Oh my yeah. And I ran into him as a maid. He was here with as manager coach of the Canadian team playing the World Open because that year they ran uh, the World Open and the World Masters together in Auckland. Mm -hmm. So I was over there. I played both events. I played the Open, got put out pretty easily in that because at that stage I was uh, 40 plus. And I played the Masters where I actually ended up uh, beating a, a hot shot from England that day. All right. <laughs> <laughs> so that was, and I ran into Ian and we were chatting over a drink uh, after I'd played the final. And 
He just happened to say that day, I said, oh, look, any jobs come up in Canada, I'm into coaching. He knew what I was doing here. And in, uh, I was coaching heavily in the Darling Downs and Toowoomba. Mm. Had a junior squad out of Willows and all of that. And uh, he said, hey, um, yeah, well, I'll let you know. And six months later, he, I'd come home from aerobics and uh, my mum was living with me at the time. And uh, she said, oh, you got a call from Canada. They, they want to talk to you. I said, oh, that's interesting. I wonder what they want. <laughs> <laughs> and that was the start of the journey. Okay. So I was interviewed. So you, you were interviewed over um, the interviewed phone? Interviewed over the phone. Right. A conference call, um, yeah. like interviewed with their, their board, five or six members uh-huh. of their board. And, and what was the job going to entail? It was entailed being the head squash pro at a private club in Edmonton. Okay. A club called the Royal Glenora Club. Right. And it was one of the biggest clubs in Alberta and as a family club and they wanted someone to build their squash program right so i ended up on a plane they wanted to further interview me after the phone interview and uh, i went over there to play a uh, women's international tournament right so they could see me play right that was part of the job that interview, was part of the job interview. <laughs> they wanted to see me play wow. and uh, they wanted to see me coach i had to go over there and coach under review and um, i spent 10 days <laughs> playing uh, being coached. Was, <laughs> anything, um, was, was nice. anything different within the squash world over there, like between countries? Is there any marked differences? Um, or oh, not really? very different. Oh, in what way? Very different. Our court system in Australia is a public court system, and as, uh, Canada and the US are private clubs. Mm. So if you think about a club here in Australia, people just pay to book a court mm-hmm. and someone manages the court. But private clubs are like golf clubs, very expensive golf clubs. So people pay to actually, on this particular club I was at, people pay a yearly fee to be on the waiting list to mm. get into that mm. club. Mm. So it's uh, it's very different. Mm. What about so, the actual game? Or is the, the game, game, oh, game the same? Oh, no, the game, um, pretty much the same. Yeah. But they were, they were at a stage of trying to build squash in Canada and the, the US was the same. Mm. So they were importing quite a few coaches mm. from Australia with coaching credentials out of here. So, so I, we were I still, happened to be lucky to be right. one of those, yeah. Australia was still pretty much known as the oh, sort of the squash, so. yeah. squash champions. We were, right. Right. we were still right up there in the world rankings at uh-huh. that stage. Right. You know. So did you take the boys over to Canada then? I took my youngest son. Right. He was uh-huh. 15 uh-huh. and my older son was uh, 18, uh, just over 18 mm-hmm. and he mm-hmm. chose to stay. Right. And that was hard. Yes, <laughs> hard yeah, work. Yeah. But um, it was his life then, and mm. he was uh, entrenched in his life here. Mm. And uh, he, I gave him the opportunity, but he chose to stay. Mm. Yeah, but my youngest son came with me, and um, he went to uh, high school over there, did his year twelve, mm-hmm. and then he chose to come back to Australia to university. Mm-hmm. So um, mm. I stayed on. I actually went on a two-year contract, but I was there ten years. For ten years, mm. wow, mm. yeah. And was yeah. it um, it was a happy time for you? Was oh, there, it was. Yeah. It it was. It was a beautiful yeah. time of my life. Um, I achieved a lot there as a coach. Yeah. Um, I made some wonderful friends mm. who are still in. I'm in touch with them, and um, I was successful as a coach there. I was very happy to be able to bring through a lot of youngsters mm-hmm. to mm. um, to be the best they could be. Mm. And and one one young boy, I started off there as a six year old, and I taught him for ten years. He actually. Um, ended up going on after I left him he was 16 years old and after I left he went to number 32 in the world wow so yeah. I, and I connected with those people again mm. in a visit back mm. lately mm. so that was pretty magic oh okay you, yeah. you've gone back and I've yeah, gone, yeah. 2018 yeah. I went back to the US to play the world masters just wow. 2018 Mm. And um, how did you go at the World Masters? I ended uh, fourth in that. Oh. I lost my semi. I lost my semi final. Yeah, I, I didn't have a good build up. I was actually renovating a house <laughs> at the time, and I was on the tools, so to speak, for six months prior to that as build up. So it wasn't a real good training session to go oh. to a Worlds. But my my ulterior purpose was to go to the Worlds and then spend three weeks in Canada, a week in each part where I had good friends. So uh, I had. I just love. I thought you were going back. to tell me, Robin, that you'd hit your ham- hand with a hammer or something <laughs> like that. But I just love the fact that you were renovating a house yeah. yourself yeah. in your build-up yeah, to I, the going to the world that masters. Was, that was my build-up. Yeah. So uh, I wasn't in great shape physically. 
I probably did more on the tools, so to speak, mm, than I should have. Mm. But it was a situation I had with the house that Literally uh, we need, needed tools. to get rid of. And do, and do you still train a lot or you just no. you play? I, I don't play a lot, actually, okay, now, right. Megan. I, I actually uh, coach more than I play, mm -hmm. but I do play the uh, age group events. So I'll play the state titles, the Australian titles, and if I ever get a chance, I'll play the Worlds. And, but I coach more than I play. Right. I coach five nights a week. Do you? Yeah. And do yeah. you? Um, can you tell pretty much straight away when you get someone coming in, you know, a young girl or a young boy, and you think this person's got a real talent, or yeah. does it does yeah. it sort of like a like a statue sort of come out of the stonework, I guess, or can you tell straight There's away? There's a bit of both. I can tell where they're going to go if the effort goes in and mm. they love it, and mm. I can achieve that. Mm. I can tell by their hand-eye coordination. Um, how much they love it. Mm. I could tell if I can build a player from that. Um, I, I've been very, very fortunate to be able to work with young juniors to get them to that level. Mm -hmm. um, comes to mind a young Pakistani boy that I started uh, when he was 15 in Brisbane. And he, it was 2013. And he'd only been in the country a couple of years, uh, straight out of Pakistan. His dad, uh, very poor circumstances. <laughs> And he came to be helped with his squash. And I work with him and I still mentor him now. He's 23. Mm -hmm. I still mentor him actually um, as a young man. But he, the, the sense of satisfaction in building a player there, he, he was hungry. He wanted to be world number one. Right. He had that desire. And my, my role there was to say, yeah, well, everyone wants to be world number one. But there's a lot of work that has to happen before you get to there. Mm. So... Uh, but the work that he did led led him to be the Australian champion as under 19 and the Oceania champion. And he's now actually one of the top two or three Brisbane players mm. uh, no, in Brisbane. Me, yeah. Oh, yeah. I mean, mm. it must just be, it must be like your babies, I guess, watching oh. these, these kids They're go through. pretty and, much yeah, like my kids. Yeah, so when right. you work closely with a, a sports person like that, they become mm. like your own kids when I'm you watch sure. them play. Uh-huh. Yeah. It becomes, you know, oh, it, your heart tears out just yes. the same. Yes. <laughs> and um, is squash in the Olympics? No, unfortunately it's not, not, Robin. What can we do no. about that? Well, maybe you can help me. <laughs> <laughs> I've been looking for help for that for many years, and a lot of other people have, Megan. Right. So, so yeah. it's in the Commonwealth Games, it's is it? in the Commonwealth right. Games. So what's uh, the logic there? Um, uh, I believe I have my own opinion. Mm -hmm. Um, I believe that squash doesn't satisfy the needs of a host city in, in terms of the that? visual, mm. in terms of the visual for TV. Right. We, uh, it's very hard for the lay person that doesn't play squash to grab the athleticism and what goes into a top game of right. squash because they make it look so easy. Mm. Mm. You know, so it, it's very hard. And I think um, we, we sort of get... Um, the Olympics, the bid for the Olympics is so exciting to have it in Brisbane in 2032. Mm -hmm. um, it'd be the dream of a lifetime for me if squash was in the Olympics mm -hmm. then. Um, we've been so close mm -hmm. a few times, but I believe that we, we get stopped with um, the visual side for TV right. because TV, TV rights are money. Yes. And, and now, understandably um, so. Yeah. Did I, is it my imagination or is this my next get rich quick scheme about <laughs> having a squash court made out of glass so that you can see it from every angle? Well, they have that already. They have that. Oh, yeah. well, that's, that's that. New that York there City, goes that scheme, yeah. One of, the, one of the major stations, railway stations in New York City has a squash court right there. Made out of glass. Mm, it's so, all glass. Yeah. Right. I, played, I played Heather Mackay on a glass court. Oh, wow. Yeah. So, well, that's right. Okay. Well, I'll, I'll forget that. Yep. I'll put I'll yeah, put that no, scheme of mine away. The but, scheme um, is great. What we need is more of them. <laughs> more of them. Right. I'm just thinking of um of the visuals, you know, yeah. for getting it into the Olympics. Now, yeah. you were telling me last weekend about you. Was it Heather Mackay that you played? Where? What was the longest rally of um? Someone had the longest that rally. Was Rhonda, yeah. not right. Can Rhonda, you tell me that story? Yeah, Rhonda Thorne, who was an ex Toowoomba girl. Um, she achieved so highly as world champion. Uh, she captained the Australian women's team to the world. She's done a host of wonderful things in squash. Um, she has the record of having the longest match in women's history, two hours, seven minutes. Wow. When she won the 1981 world 
World Championship Open. Mm -hmm. Open. I'm open, talking open. I've won World Masters Championships. This is open. Okay. Yeah. 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 So yeah. Very like, different. Yeah, very yeah, different. Yeah. Uh huh. Yeah. And um and did you play against her as well at any stage? Rhonda. Yes. Um. Yes, I did. But Rhonda became um part of my Queensland team. So that little girl that used to run around at the Melbourne Bay Pool years ago became world champion, but she was a Queensland champ too. Okay. And she right. became my team captain. Right. And I was in many teams that toured with her, toured mm. across, playing the Australian mm. titles. Yeah. Mm. yeah, amazing. I think of all the things that you've seen and all the wonderful um, um, friendships that squash has brought yeah. to you, it hasn't, it's sort of just been a wonderful thing for you to have been involved with, hasn't it? It's really shaped your life. It's, it is your life. It, it, it has been a big part of my life outside my family life. Mm -hmm. It's been a big chunk of my life. Mm -hmm. and, and a lot of my friends and, and the wonderful friends I've made, are, it's valuable. Mm -hmm. and, and that reunion last Saturday night here was was sort of like a testament of how how the friendships get built through sport mm. and you know the squash uh, that's where I'm so passionate Megan about Toowoomba squash this was my this was my breeding ground for squash there was so much uh, heart and soul went into mm. it not just as mm. a player mm. like I was on every committee that was going um, media news media everything you could name to keep the name of squash mm. alive and i'm still pretty passionate about mm. that so well, is this is this is the only squash courts in toowoomba now this it, center it is. here in james street it yeah. is and um, as i came through here there's a big competition going on yeah. this weekend this weekend that's... yeah it's the uh, toowoomba masters this weekend uh, i'm president of queensland masters and it's one of our scheduled tournaments through the year we have about 18 tournaments in the year mm. and this is one of them and this this the feature of this one is we've had a an open event uh open invitational as well so as well as getting the best masters in the play in the in the state in around brisbane and sunshine coast gold coast we've got open players coming to play that are open masters mm -hmm. so and we've got a couple of uh, other people to fill the draw that are just under the age group so the squash level is probably the best in the state right. that they're seeing this weekend down to probably the oldest person playing i think is 85. 85 there's a couple of oh, players playing here. yeah there's a couple playing that are in their 80s well i did make the observation last weekend at the reunion that squash players have a very good physique you're all very sort of lean and um healthy looking lean and so mean. Yeah, lean yeah, and mean. Lean and mean. it might be well it's a great weekend they're here for the carnival as well Well, it is yeah. and, and Toowoomba always has their tournament at this time of the year right so next year the tournament will be at the same time and the planning's in place already for that yeah so we go from here um yeah the masters movement is probably the biggest participation of squash mm. in the world mm. So Masters is where it started. Yes, yeah. So it's now in participation rates. It's huge. Is it right? Oh, well, it's huge. Um, in twenty nineteen, I I was uh, tournament uh, chair for our Australian Masters titles in on the Gold Coast, mm. and we had over six hundred players. Mm. Is in that, that because tournament. you think like it was sort of really big in the? sort of 70s, 80s, and those yes. people are moving through. Are you yes. getting the younger ones coming up behind, though? We are, to mm. an extent. We, we, we could do with more. Um, we need a transition of open players who are toning down their open years, and we need that movement into masters. Because mm. our younger age groups, we need to feed the masters movement. Mm. And that, that is happening quite well. Mm. We, we have a couple of membership drives. So we had a membership drive last year. And uh, we're starting a women in squash incentive this year that uh, that I help create for next year. Okay. So we're trying to get novice women coming out to play. This weekend we've got novice women here from Toowoomba okay. that are being playing a little bit, so they're not overwhelmed. Mm -hmm. They come in and play a novice masters. Nice. And yeah. then get see how okay. they go and just get the feeling of it. So mm. do you just sort of hang around the tennis courts and see anyone that might be a disaffected tennis player like yourself and just <laughs> think, <laughs> I'll just recruit them into the squash world? Uh, we, we go around the squash courts where they have uh, fixture players happening that just play. There's a lot of players playing, but they don't think about playing masters. Okay. So we try to transition them out of the fixture play 
into the Masters, the daytime comps into Masters. Yeah. So that's yeah. our plan for yeah. next year. Yeah, well, that yeah. sounds good. It's pretty so, um, I just want to ask you about the Robin Prentice Oval. Tell me about that um, sporting oval that was awarded, that was named after you by the council in 1998. Is that correct? That's correct, yes. Um, that was quite a, an honour, actually. Um, I was in Canada at the time, and uh, I was one of many uh, at the time that was honoured for the sporting achievements. And, and I think uh, part, of, part of my award was for the amount of work I'd put into doing uh, helping squash in Toowoomba as well as my achievements. But uh, it was a real honour that mm. uh, came through there. And um, it was almost posthumously, actually, oh. because I'd left Toowoomba yeah, at that right. stage. You yes, know, yes. I was but you weren't dead, though. I wasn't dead, no. no but it, seemed, <laughs> it seemed, oh, wow, this is great. Like, you know, and I couldn't be there for the event because yeah. uh, I was across the other side of the world. But my... My uh, my sister actually went along on my behalf on the night. Right. But, Whereabouts um, is the Robin Prentice Sporting It's actually oval? Um, in the Nell Robinson Park. Oh, lovely. Yeah, yeah. it's down uh, on the top, one of the top ovals there. Wonderful. Um, and it, it was moved a little bit because they turned the um, grass into the um, uh, AstroTurf for netball. Mm -hmm. So I think there was they did some changes over right. the years. But there's many ovals in Toowoomba after Toowoomba Sporting Greats. Sporting greats. identities. Yeah. So yeah. you have been up there, I would hope, and sort of had your photo taken with the sign. and uh, uh, A couple of times. Oh, just a few times, <laughs> that's right. <laughs> Usually when my Canadian visitors come, they want to go see it. Oh, <laughs> it's, it's just a wonderful thing. Yeah. Yeah. I, um, I came up here, we had a junior tournament up here just lately, and the juniors that I coach in Brisbane, I brought up to play. Mm -hmm. And uh, they were all saying, come, we want to go see your oval, Rob. So <laughs> we tripped up there in the day, the wind was blowing our heads uh -huh. off, and uh, they all wanted a photo around the oval. So that's hey, the last so time we had photos uh, with my young juniors. Oh, that's lovely. Yeah. I'll have to go up there and have a look. Yeah. Now I'm going to ask you a curly one. A curly one? Yeah, oh, curly good. one. I love curly ones. Yeah. So if um, you could do anything illegal and get away with it, what would it be, do you think? Any, <laughs> anything illegal and get away with it. In, mm. in, you mean in squash? If, no, not like, um, you know, <laughs> putting your foot over the line or, you know, hitting the ball um, or bouncing the ball twice or whatever you do in I squash. If I could do anything illegal. And not get caught, what would it be? Right now? Yes. Right now? Yes. If I could do anything illegal and not get caught, <laughs> it would be to get in my car, drive to Victoria, and visit my family in Victoria that I can't see right now. Yeah, no, that's, that's a what nice I'd one. Do. That's a, it's a <laughs> nice thing to say. It's not even, you know, it's just, it's so, such a lovely sentiment that, uh, <laughs> And it's so typical, I think, of Robin Prentice. And my last curly one, when you were a child, did you ever have an imaginary friend? And what was their name? When I was a child, an imaginary friend. I don't think I did have an imaginary friend, but... Um, I suppose if you had five brothers and sisters, you didn't I, need an didn't, imaginary friend. I didn't friend, need an yeah. imaginary friend, but they are all older than me, remember. So I think... Um, my imaginary friend was I spent a lot of time on my own mm. and um, so I had to make up things to to do and think about my favorite thing to do was uh, going down to the creek out Dolby Way and catching yabbies right yes yeah. <laughs> a little bit of a twig and a string line and a bit of meat on the end that was one of my mm. favorite memories from my childhood so you've always and, been uh, very self-contained you could go and do that and yeah. on your own and yeah, yeah. pretty much and and uh, I was into my books. I was very a uh, big reader. Um, in Toowoomba, when I came into Toowoomba, we had the library. Oh, magic to have the right. library. So I used to read three or four books a week. Is that right? Yeah. 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 And it was I there loved and reading. they were free. And, yeah. yeah. And that was my, um, that was my uh, I guess, apart from going to school uh, and my sport, that was my recreation. Because yeah. that's what the recreation was those days. Mm. There wasn't much TV mm. happening. There wasn't a, a lot of video stuff, mm. movies, all of that. It's wonderful. Um, yeah. Yeah, I did a lot of, um, as a kid, I, I did a lot of things that I wouldn't be heard of now. Like, like going down <laughs> the like, creek on your like own? Going and... down to the creek on my own, riding to school on my own, riding all around Toowoomba to tennis. Um, and younger than that, I used to go around on my bike and catch, uh, gather up the, the 20 cent bottles that you could take 
to go and get pocket money. I mm-hmm. did a lot of that mm-hmm. as a young kid That's in Toowoomba right. when I first well, came into um, the city. The, um, mm-hmm. I know um, we talk about the, the regional active um, public transport at, um, at council and apparently the biggest problem or the biggest prohibitor of kids riding their bikes now is the parents. The parents don't want the kids riding no. the bikes so, no. No. because I suppose we're all worried about the danger but I mean in a lot of ways there was a lot of freedom, um, a lot of lovely things that you yeah. could do when you're a kid uh, yeah. back in the day. Uh, there was it? a lot of that and uh, the other thing, you, I'm going back to your question if I could do something illegal. Again. Now that I've given you a little bit of time to given think about that. Given me a little time right. to think about that. If I could do anything that would give me a lot of joy and a lot of people joy right now, I would go rob a bank and build the best squash <laughs> in Toowoomba that people would, it would be like my club in Canada that had a, a wedding facility and it had a sports lounge and it had a swimming pool. And it had every sport going, and I would build that. <laughs> well, on that note, I just love the sound of that, and I love a great big Robin Prentice sort of mannequin y type um, statue outside. That, <laughs> that, um, but that's a wonderful thought, isn't it? And um, a, a wonderful thought to think. The, the bonds that sport um, provides, it's, it's, it's irreplaceable. It's the fabric yeah. of our society. And, well, um, it is. Yeah. But it as is. I said at the right at the beginning, someone's got to drive it and, yeah. um, and you're a doer and you drive it. Well, I do my bit. I'm still doing my bit at this stage of my life. And uh, I believe a lot of people are trying to do their bit. There's, we just don't get enough help. Uh, our sport is, um, is a minor sport, Megan. We're a minor sport, we don't get the funding. Um, I was talking to uh, one of the guys on the Squash Queensland board today, and the funding we actually get through is very, very, um, very, very um, limited because we're not one of the major sports. Mm -hmm. So we can only do so much, Mm -hmm. and most of it is back to volunteer times, which is what I started with years ago. It was everyone, everyone squash in Australia was built on volunteers, love. Mm, mm, and we've gone back to that to a degree because of the lack of funding mm. coming through from the government mm. and, and others. Mm. Um, so we, we struggle with that a bit, but I've got to say it's a huge participation sport, a lot more than people realise. Mm. And I'm, I'm, I'm very vocal on trying to help that in Toowoomba community mm-hmm. and outlying areas mm. because squash, is, is vibrant here again, as you can see by what you walked into today. Mm. If you're walking here on a uh, uh, afternoon of the week, you'll see juniors running around, there's juniors happening here. Mm. There's lots of things Wonderful. happening at Toowoomba Squash. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Robert. That's okay. That's it for this week. Thanks for joining me on Big Little Small Talk. I hope you can make the time to join me next week. If you've enjoyed this episode, please subscribe on your favourite podcast app.